Okay, so in this video, what I'm going to go over is quantification of your DNA sample. Um, it really matters when you are doing a library preparation that you have some good idea of how much DNA you are inputting into the system uh, because the protocol already takes into account um, how many steps, what's going to be lost, how much do you need, what should you end up with it. It's, it's, uh, it's already been calculated. Uh, and so the better the estimate that you have of the input DNA, um, you know, that maximizes the chance of a good outcome. You have a number of options of quantifying your DNA. Uh, and I should also say characterizing your DNA. And I'll, I'll, I'll try to remember to say something about that at the end. In terms of quantifying the DNA, uh, what we're uh, at a minimum trying to do is to figure out how many nanograms of DNA have we gotten from a DNA extraction. In the particular example for uh, this video, we're using the bacterial samples, the isolate samples, prepared using the Monarch High Molecular Weight Kit. That'll matter in a moment. Uh, we are going to use a, a qubit device, so it's a fluorimeter, and essentially we're going to add a chemical that will selectively bind to DNA and then measure um, the, the uh, absorption or transmission of light um, uh, using this system. There are other options. Probably the other one that's quite um, extensively used is the nanodrop. So that's one option. If you did not have a, uh, either of those devices, because they are fairly expensive, um, and unless you're doing a lot of nanopore sequencing, it may not be worth your while to purchase one uh, if, if you can't afford it. If you can, great. Um, but it's something that you could borrow, because you literally need it for just a moment. Um, so perhaps you could drive your samples uh, to someone who has one and use it that way. It might be possible to some extent to use gel electrophoresis. You'll have to be careful and it's not going to be as accurate. It might give you some idea. Um, what's the difference between those options? And there's a third one. Um, there's something called that we use, for example, at the Genome Center, a femtopulse um, by Agilent. And that's a really, really accurate, but also super expensive and not something that uh, even individual labs would usually have more core facilities. Um, so the qubit is going to be really good at telling you what, how many nanograms. It's going to quantify the DNA. There is a debate. I don't want to get into it, uh, and I might not be the most informed at the where, wherever it stands um, about the nanodrop in terms of how well it will quantify your DNA. One thing the nano, uh, nanodrop is really good at, however, is characterizing your DNA. So you can look at the absorbance, the 260 to 80 ratios, and you can actually tell how pure your DNA is. Is there protein? Are there salts? Are there other things? Do you have a really nice curve and the expected ratios uh, of absorbance or do you have something else? So nanodrop is good for that. Um, the femtopulse, uh, pulse, for example, um, that will also tell you something that you is nice to know. I would argue maybe not always essential to know. Um, it will also give you not only the quantity of your DNA, but it'll actually tell you the size of the DNA fragments. And there are some places in the protocols that we're going to be using where um, if you do know the size, you can make some more accurate guesses uh, about how you should proceed in the protocol. If you don't know the expected size, then you're going to guess. Um, and you'll see, you know, I haven't totally failed, uh, but those are some uncertainties. So how does this work? I have three DNA samples uh, of this high molecular weight DNA that was prepared. Uh, one really interesting thing, this has only been sitting at 37 uh, degrees for an hour. It looks somewhat well sol solubilized. Uh, maybe if it went for longer at a lower temperature, we'd see something different. But something that's important to note here is that this is extremely viscous and that is going to compromise my ability to really get an accurate um, assessment and even you know if I if I pull DNA from the surface the, the first couple of microliters that may have a different viscosity than a, a, a region here where um, there is more of this phlegmy DNA. Um, I also think because I have so much DNA in there 
that uh, there is the chance using my qubit um, that I may um, have way too much DNA to actually quantify. The kit that I happen to have, the assay, is the high sensitivity assay, so it's good even for really tiny amounts. So they have broad spectrum assays, and it depends on your outlook on the world. If you think you're going to always have tons of DNA, you might want a broader spectrum. If you are, um, what's the word, a little bit of a uh, less than an optimist will say, you might be looking to say, uh, even if I have a nanogram, I want to be able to at least know that I have a nanogram. So what I've preemptively done, just in case, to help a little bit at least, is I've taken my samples, I'll try to measure them and see if, if, they, if they give anything. But I've also already taken the samples and preemptively diluted them 1 to 10. Um, maybe that'll be enough, we'll see. Um, the other thing that you need, okay, so you need, of course, the, the, the actual device. You'll need the assay kit, and in this case, the assay kit comes with a pre-made light-sensitive solution, so it's in a dark plastic, and two uh, chemical standards. And so we're going to follow the protocol, which is really short, to prepare those and then also prepare um, the samples. The other thing that's, I guess, slightly special is that this will come with assay tubes that are unique to this device, so these are recommended for you to use. Could you use other tubes? Maybe. Um, I'm assuming that they know that those tubes, there's nothing in the plastic that might interfere. It's possible other similar tubes, maybe that doesn't work exactly the same, so I'd recommend using the assay tubes. So I've got my tubes, which I've already labeled, and first I start by making my standards. And for those, I'm going to need 190 microliters. I kind of remember it, but I have it written down here too. 190 microliters of the solution. That's going to be for the standard. So I have two standards, standard one and two. They both get 190. And I already know um, that I'm going to use one microliter of all of my DNA samples. So I can go ahead and already aliquot carefully 199 microliters into my six other tubes. This is uh, normally kept in the fridge at 4 degrees C. Um, once everything is mixed, the recommendation is to let it sit for two minutes and let everything equilibrate. It is, there is some temperature dependence. Now for the standards, I need 10 microliters of those standards. Okay, read the label. Standard, which one? Standard number one, okay. I, you know, finger vortex, try to get rid of your air bubbles. Okay, then we'll do the same thing for standard number two. Okay, and then for my actual samples, uh, I just need one microliter each. So I'll do them at least twice. Uh, I have the actual undiluted DNA, which is extremely viscous. 
and it's viscous to the point where it's even hard to get one microliter. You kind of see it sliming up, but I'll try. Make sure I take the right one. Yep, it's very viscous. And I'll do my diluted samples. Okay, so I am going to finger vortex and then make sure I have a two minute timer. And then we'll go ahead and I'll show you on a close up uh, just the operation of the device. It's fairly, I would say, easy to use. Okay. So we are gonna go ahead and try this. Uh, we're gonna choose the assay, and first we need to read the standards. So we open the port there. Let me read the standards. Um, I'm doing everything within a minute or so, a couple minutes of um, running samples, so I don't feel particularly compelled to make new standards, but if things have been sitting a while, I would uh, think about that. And there may be some recommendations that you can go by in the, in the protocols. Okay, so let's look at the 1 in 100 dilution. I've got three samples, so I'm going to enter that sample. This is one microliter of the sample. Uh, down uh, 100 times diluted. So it says 8.2. Six nanograms per microliter for sample four, and that's times one hundred. So almost, almost um, one nanogram per um, one hundred na nanograms. Well, one microgram because we're doing one uh, times one hundred. So almost one thousand nanograms <laughs> per microliter. So. That's sample four, um, sample 19. Okay, pretty similar. 7.82 times 100. And sample 20. I think um, the range of the broad assay um, would have worked better. So next time I'll pull that one out of the fridge, but I guess it's just as well. But um, you just can see that you'll need to dilute sometimes. Um, this is also important to know because when we do the library prep, getting the concentration of such something so, so viscous correct is hard and, and dilution may be warranted. So. We'll have to think about it. I've just been diluting in water, um, but we'll consider that. But uh, that's it for quantification, and we have what we need to move on to library preparation.